Headline, Supreme Court order suspends contraception rule for Christian college. The Supreme Court sided Thursday with religiously affiliated nonprofit groups in a clash between religious freedom and women's rights in the story by Adam Liptak. The decision temporarily bars the government from enforcing against a Christian college part of the regulations that provide contraception coverage under the Affordable Care Act. The order was brief, provisional, and unsigned, but Justices Sotomayor, Ginsburg, and Elena Kagan were infuriated. They noted that the court has betrayed a promise it made on Monday in Hobby Lobby, which involved for-profit corporations. Justice Sotomayor dissented. She said, those who are bound by our decisions usually believe they can take us at our words. Not so today. This is regarding Wheaton College in Illinois. Non-profit, of course. And look, suddenly Hobby Lobby has become not so narrow anymore. In point of fact, not only this, but some of the president's own allies, President Obama's own allies, have since circulated a letter. Yep. You're going to love this, because you just can't beat a narrow decision. Molly Ball has the story at The Atlantic. This week in the Hobby Lobby case, the Supreme Court ruled that a religious employer could not be required to provide employees, yada, yada, yada. We know that part. We don't know this part. The, the, the narrowness is wearing off. A group of <clears throat> faith leaders <clears throat> is urging the Obama administration to include a religious exemption in a forthcoming LGBT anti-discrimination case. Ha ha! There we are! So, not-for-profit colleges just got a pass on the, uh, on the, on the uh, um, original sin-bearing women people. And now we want to unnarrow the decision so that it's not just about the women people. Now it's going to be about the LGBT people. And again, these are the president's own allies. Here, let's read their letter. Dear Mr. President, as religious and civic leaders who seek to advance the common good, we write to urge you to include a religious exemption in your planned executive order addressing federal contractors and LGBT employment policies. See how I almost said contraceptives? Oof. We have great appreciation for your commitment to human dignity and justice, and we share those values with you. With respect to the proposed executive order, because since Congress won't do anything, the president is going to act by executive order to make sure that uh, do this won't discriminate because, because every time we expand rights, every time we contract uh, and and and, uh, the, and and hopefully someday eliminate the ability of uh, corporations, contractors, and the like to discriminate against people based on things those people have no control over whatsoever, like race or. Or, which is, of course, a construct, or sexuality, or gender preference, or because we've already got it in there for race and uh, creed, religion, that kind of. Well, we're going to expand it to include uh, uh, LGBT status. And remember, the faith leaders are telling uh, President Not Sure right off the bat that, by golly, they're working for the common good, us commoners, right? You know it. We have great appreciation for your commitment to human dignity and justice. And we share those values with you. With respect to the proposed executive order, we agree that banning discrimination is a good thing. We believe that all persons are created in the divine image of the Creator, and here they go believing again, and are worthy of respect and love without exception. Remember, hate the, uh, uh, hate the sin, love the sinner. Yeah, this is that. Even so, see, you knew there was going to be an even so or a but or something there. It, it still may not be possible for all sides to reach a consensus on every issue. That is why we are asking that an extension of protection for one group not come at the expense of faith communities whose 
religious identity and beliefs motivate them to serve those in need. Americans have always disagreed on important issues, but now our ability to live with our diversity is part of what makes this country great, and, if, and it continues to be essential even in the 21st century. This ability is essential in light of our national conversation on political and cultural issues related to sexuality. We have and will continue to communicate on these broader issues to our congregations, our policymakers, and our nation. But we focus here on the importance of religious exemption in your planned executive order, disqualifying organizations that do not hire LGBT Americans from receiving federal contracts. This religious exemption would be comparable to what was included in the Senate version of the Employment Non-Discrimination Act, which, was, which passed the Senate with a strong bipartisan vote and died in the House. Without a robust religious exemption, like the provisions in the Senate passed ENDA, this expansion of hiring rights will come at an unreasonable cost to the common good, national unity, and religious freedom. When you announced the White House Office of Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships, you said the following. The particular faith that motivates each of us can promote a greater good for all of us. Instead of drawing us apart, our very beliefs can bring us together to feed the hungry and comfort the afflicted, to make peace where there is strife and rebuild what was broken, to lift up those who have fallen on hard times. <sighs> We could not agree with you more. Our identity as individuals is based first and foremost in our faith, and religious beliefs are at the foundation of some of America's greatest charities and service organizations that do incredible good for our nation and for the world. In fact, serving the common good is one of the highest expressions of one's religious liberty outside of worship. The hiring policies of these organizations, Christian, Jewish, Muslim, and others, extend from their religious beliefs and values, the same values that motivate them to serve their neighbors in the first place. Mm. Mm. Often in American history, and indeed in partnership with your administration, government and religious organizations have worked together to better serve the nation. An executive order that does not include a religious exemption will significantly and substantively hamper the work of some religious organizations that are best equipped to serve in common purpose with the federal government. In a concrete way, religious organizations will lose financial funding that allows them to serve others in the national interest due to their organizational identity. When the capacity of religious organizations is limited, the common good suffers, so it takes them a page and a half to get down to the nut of the problem. Please, please, please let us keep discriminating against people based on how they love each other so that we can keep getting government contracts from taxpayers because if we don't, we'll have to find honest work. Please let us keep being bigots. Please let us keep uh, manifesting our prejudice. Please let us keep hiding behind the skirts of the First Amendment so that we can go on hating because we really like the government money. We really, really do like getting the taxpayer dollars from we, the people of the United States, out there trying to form that more perfect union. We really, really do. But we really have to keep on hating people. I'm talking about reparative therapy and how Jesus wants everybody to be straight, 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 straight. Isn't that just delightful? Our concern about an executive order without a religious exemption is about more than the direct financial impact on religious organizations. No, it's not. While the nation has undergone incredible social and legal change over the last decade, we still live in a nation with different beliefs about sexuality. Well, maybe people should stop having beliefs about sexuality. Just like people, just like people should stop having beliefs about contraception. These are not open to debate. They do what they do. They are science-based, not belief-based. You see, the, it, it, there's an underlying danger here. And that is, and, and see, this is how theocracies happen. 
Theocracies happen when, you, when, when people's beliefs, in other words, their imaginations, are allowed to trump the scientific method. They don't know that their God doesn't approve of gay people. They believe it. They don't know that their God is just going to boot all the LGBT people into hell. They believe it. And they believe it not because they've had conversations with their imaginary God, but because the hate that motivates them lives inside their own infernal, rotten, pustulant beings. We must find a way to respect diversity of opinion on this issue in a way that respects the dignity of all parties to the best of our ability. There is no perfect solution that will make all parties completely happy. In other words, uh, we're going to be miserable if we don't get the federal contract money, and we think it is better if we make gay people be the miserable people, if the LGBTQQQ community is the one out there suffering. Not us, because God loves us. Hi, John Calvin. As we know, you understand, a religious exemption in this executive order would not guarantee that religious organizations would receive contracts. Instead, a religious exemption would simply maintain that religious organizations will not be automatically disqualified or disadvantaged in obtaining contracts because of their religious beliefs. Jesus God, I can't wait until Boeing and Rockwell and Anodyne Systems or what the fuck ever uh, or, or any of these defense I can't wait until I can't wait until they file and say well wait a minute I mean granted we make stuff that blows people into molecules but but God is love can we discriminate too I'm just going to laugh my happy little ass off when that happens Yeah, we're, we're really running out of narrowness here, aren't we? I mean, we are fresh plum out of narrow. Sammy Bad Breath, just as Sammy Bad Breath, done wore out all his narrow on Monday, didn't he? And now it's broad like the road to hell. It's broad like, like Plessy got broad. Oh, this is only a case about railroad cars and whether brown people and good God-fearing, upstanding, Bible-believing white people can ride together on the same railroad car. It's a narrow holding. And the next day, uh, Jim Crow laws and, and segregation laws pop up like toadstools after a spring rain all over the South. And, well, son of a bitch, what happened to all the narrowness? You, there you go. You see, you got a nice, narrow decision, and then somebody comes along and and gets it all broaded up. Damn broads. Mr. President, during your first presidential campaign, you were asked your views on same-sex marriage. You responded, I believe that marriage is the union between a man and a woman. Now, for me as a Christian, it is also a sacred union. God's in the mix. I am not somebody who promotes same-sex marriage. God's in the mix. You know, with the monosodium glutamate and the baking powder and the, um, the calcium diphosphate to prevent caking. and it, Yeah, sure, he's in the mix. And just add a sprinkle of God and look at the Christian muffins you get. You justified withholding your support for same-sex marriage, at least in part, by appealing to your Christian faith. But we all know you're Muslim. And even if you're a Christian, you were the wrong kind of Christian because you were listening to that Jeremiah Wright. Yet you still believe you could serve your country, all Americans, as president. See, there's that believing again. Similarly, some faith-based organizations' religious identity requires that their employees share that identity. We still believe those organizations can serve their country, all Americans, in partnership with their government and as welcome members of the American family. This is part of what has been so powerful about religious liberty in our nation's history. Jesus, they didn't send him a letter, they sent him a sermon. Page three. 
Historically, we have been reticent as a nation to use the authority of government to bless some religious identities and ostracize others. But we really would like it if you would do that. I mean, you know, maybe it's time for the Unitarian Universalists to really step up their game. What he's talking about, you know, under 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 the co- under the cover of all of this uh, uh, sappy, soppy, kumbaya BS, is he's talking about like Catholic charities that uh, that that feed people and things like that, but would really like to make sure that they don't have to hire no homos. Do we have any do we have any non discriminatory religions out there that could step into this breach and, 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 and let and let the and let the, the, the discriminators and the bigots uh, and the and the and the homophobes and the misogynists go and do whatever it there is is gonna that they're gonna do, but do it without federal money? How about the United Churches of Christ? Could they step in? Or and I know this is completely crazy. Could we stop giving taxpayer dollars to churches? I mean, that's insult on injury, isn't it? We give them welfare in the first place because we don't make them pay taxes. And then, which means, of course, that we are subsidizing them with taxpayer money in the first place. And then, having done that, we turn around and give them taxpayer money outright. Can we not have any religion-neutral stuff? Does everything have to have God in the mix? We live in a blessed nation, constantly perfecting its fundamental ideal that no matter what God you pray to, what you look like, or who you are, there's a place in this nation for you if you seek to serve your fellow Americans. Even if you want to discriminate against people for how they love each other. There's a place for you in America. Yeah, it's called the Klan. Religious organizations, because of their religious faith, have served their nation well for centuries. They haven't been getting federal dollars for centuries. Let's be honest here. Oh, wait, I'm talking about religious people. We can't talk about honesty. As you have acknowledged and supported time and time again, we hope that religious organizations can continue to do so on equal footing with others. In the future, a religious exemption in your executive order on LGBT employment rights would allow for this, balancing the government's interest in protecting both LGBT Americans as well as for the religious, as well as the religious organizations that seek to serve in accordance with their faith and their values. You know, the faith that God is going to throw the homos into hell and the values that say that maybe they can help God by moving the process along a little bit. Sincerely... Dr. Joel C. Hunter, Senior Pastor, Northland, a church distributed. Was it a church distributed? What are they? What are they in a warehouse? They got trucks. Uh, Father Larry Snyder, CEO, Catholic Charities USA. What does God need with a CEO or a starship? Obligatory Star Trek reference. Kathy Dahl Kemper, County Executive, Erie County, PA, former member of Congress. Really, the County Executive of Erie County, PA. How's she got a dog in this hunt? Oh, and there he is. Dr. Rick Warren, senior pastor, Saddlebrokeback Church. I mean, Saddleback Church. You know, the author of The Porpoise Driven Life. Gabe Lyons, President Q Ideas. Dr. Stephen Schneck, Director, Institute for Religion and Democracy, the Catholic University of America. Michael Ware, consultant, and see, that's Barack Obama's buddy. National Faith Vote Director, Obama for America 2012. Stephanie Summers, CEO, Center for Public Justice. Reverend Noel Castellanos, CEO, Christian Community Development Association. Doc D. Michael Lindsay, D. Michael Lindsay, D. Camp Town Races. D. Michael Lindsay, President, Gordon College. Andy Crouch, Executive Director, Christianity Today. Stephen Bauman, President and CEO, World Relief. Jenny Yang, Vice President for Policy and Advocacy, World Relief. And Bill Blockery, President and CEO, Bethany Christian Services. That narrow's done got all out of its bounds, hasn't it? Mm-hmm. 
You know it. You know what? Now that, and and this this phrase keeps getting brought up uh, the, about the camel's nose getting under the tent. And I love to I love to analyze metaphors, and we've done this. I mean, I've mentioned this a couple of times. What it, what it means is when the camel's nose is under the tent, the camel is in the tent. Because camels just aren't things that you want in your house. And because of the curvy nature of a camel's neck and the fact that it leads to the hump, once the camel's nose is under the tent, you, the, the hump is soon to follow, and pretty soon you're standing around in your tent with a camel, shitting and spitting and stinking. Just as Sammy Badbreath said that, now this is a narrow decision Hobby Lobby is, and but but we're going to say that the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which is undergirded by the First Amendment, which depends on the First Amendment, we're going to say that the Religious Freedom Restoration Act uh, creates a narrow little space for just the tiniest, itsy-bitsiest of camels to get under the tent of, of, uh, uh, of discrimination. And we're going to say that Hobby Lobby gets to discriminate against women based upon how they choose to engage in contraception, based on the First Amendment. And golly, this is such a narrow decision. Well, it's not. Because once you carve out a religious exception for one group, you kind of have to keep carving if you're going to remain consistent. And so there's all kinds of cases in the pipelines about uh, how businesses treat LGBT people. And we now have precedent because the Supreme Court is supposed to operate on precedent and a concept called stare decisis. In other words, old decisions get certain, or previously made decisions, get a certain gravity and weight applied to them unless it can be shown that they are just entirely, utterly, and completely wrong. Supreme Court decisions become the law of the land. And the law of the land now is that a corporation can discriminate. You know, a for-profit, closely held corporation can discriminate against a woman based upon what kind of contraception she chooses as long as the closely held corporation says it's doing so because Jesus but once you've allowed that to happen, you have to acknowledge other things, other beliefs, and other areas of inquiry. And so, lo and behold, on Tuesday, July, uh, July the 1st, you had uh, cases affecting about 50 different companies that were bounced back uh, to their courts of origin, saying, render a decision in accordance with the decision that we have ruled on today. In other words, all the religious objectors win. Now we have the story from the New York Times that Kim sent along that shows that it's being applied to not-for-profit educational institutions. And here we have this letter published in the Atlantic that shows that the religion industry is now jumping out there to say, well, you said we could discriminate against the women. Why can't we, in the name of Jesus, discriminate against women who happen to be lesbians? I mean, that's twice as good a reason to discriminate, isn't it? Because I mean, not all of us agree about uh, not all of us agree about uh, about contraception, and not all of us agree about about lesbians. But those of us who who want to make sure that no lesbians are out there uh, uh, doling out doling out ladles full of thin pissant soup to the poor. Well, if, if you want to make sure that no, that no lesbians are doing that, by God, as long as you say that Jesus told you, well, you got to let them do it, Barack. you got to let them do it. Narrow decision. Note coming in from uh, our buddy Steve in New York. Subject line, Hobby Lobby Rat Hole. Bob, stop kicking yourself about not going down the Hobby Lobby Rat Hole. This case is such a departure from jurisprudence in English or American law dating back a thousand freaking years that you need to be hammering this home every time it comes up or its implications rear their ugly heads. This decision is so over the top and so egregious, you have no choice but to keep filibobstering. I will tell you this. That decision 
was the official, unequivocal, last nail in the coffin for the Constitution in this country. Game over. Take your ball and go home. Finis, finito, fertish. The only way to even resurrect this dead republic is to keep reminding everyone, anyone, about this destructive and morally bankrupt decision. Thank you, Steve. I haven't gotten up a morning yet since Monday. Actually, I spent Sunday and Saturday dreading Monday. And then Monday happened. And I got up Tuesday morning going, God, what have they done to my country? And I got up Wednesday and it didn't feel any better. And I got up today and it's still icky. And it keeps getting ickier because all that narrowness keeps leaking out of the room and getting filled up with camel. Honest to God, these people that want to discriminate so achingly, they l oh, I've been saying we haven't been using this word enough, they long to discriminate because it makes them feel better somehow. And I don't understand the sick psychosis involved with that, but it does. It is 7.09 p.m. in the Eastern Daylight Time Zone. That means somewhere in Oklahoma City, it's 6.09 p.m. And the, and the Green family are sitting down and around their dinner table and they're all holding hands and they're saying grace and they're saying, Thank you, Jesus, for delivering us from the bondage of the secular humanists. Thank you, Jesus, for making us billionaires who can use our money to force our vision of you upon the rest of the country. Thank you, Jesus, for letting us begin to shred the Constitution into a thousand tiny, tiny, itsy-bitsy, microscopic pieces. Thank you, Jesus. It may be apocryphal, but there is that statement about the Constitutional Convention and someone coming up to old Ben Franklin as he was walking along and saying, Mr. Franklin, Mr. Franklin, what kind of government do we have? And Franklin looking at him and saying, a republic, if you can keep it. Because see, going into the Constitutional Convention, there was no guarantee. There were no guarantees about what was going to come out of the Constitutional Convention. The Constitutional Convention, legally, under the rules, under the Articles of Confederation, wasn't even supposed to be called. Not a jot, not a dot, not a tittle of the Articles of Confederation could be changed according to the Articles themselves without the unanimous agreement of all signatories to it, i.e. the 13 states. So the framers of the Constitution just called a Constitutional Convention and said, we're not changing the Articles of Confederation, we're getting rid of the goddamn things. And all of a sudden the barn door flew open and the horse was gone and it had the bit in its teeth. And there was talk of monarchy, there was talk of... Uh, unicameral legislatures, there was talk of, uh, of heredity, uh, all of this stuff. And there was no guarantee of what form the government was going to take. And whether it's true or not, it's a nice story. A republic, if you can keep it. Guess what? We didn't. We didn't. You know what all that business I was saying earlier at the beginning of the program about um, uh, taking note of everything that went out, went into our independence and our growth as a nation. I, I retract all of that. Bullshit. Party your brains out tomorrow. Forget about every single human being who ever shed the first damn drop of blood in the name of this nation. Forget it. Eat, drink, and be merry for this country, this republic, this experiment in self-government is dead. Maybe it died a long time ago. I don't know. But anyone who listens to this program for any length of time knows that I think that this is not a republic. Democracy has never been practiced in this country. I mean, I mentioned the other night the letter from Abigail Adams to John Adams of, of March 31st, 1776, in which she said, Do not forget about the ladies, John! Because we will foment a rebellion if you do. 
Well, they did forget about the ladies. And the ladies didn't. Because they didn't have any damn rights in the first place. Debates over, over how much freedom to grant freed slaves in the Congress uh, that was absent the southern states during the Civil War when they were talking about the question of the vote. Expressly within that debate was the fact that they were talking about black males voting. Neither black females, white females, or, or native females got the first moment's consideration. We don't do democracy in this country. It is aspirational and not operational. Sorry about that. I didn't mean to, be, to put a big old bummer out there, but when you take something as central as freedom from religion and you all but destroy it, as the court did, it is hard to remain dispassionate. It just is.